President Yoon will this week be in the U.S. for a state visit marking the 70th anniversary of the alliance between Seoul and Washington. Separate from the commemoration lies a host of security, economic and diplomatic issues to be ironed out with a sense of urgency. For a preview of the president's itinerary, we're now joined by Professor Kim byung ju of the Hankook University of Foreign Studies. Good morning, Professor Kim. Good morning. All right, so it was in our headlines, uh, but we need an expert analysis. Can you first get our listeners caught up? What kinds of notable events do you see in President Yoon's itinerary, and how well is it organized to leave up to its main theme or its mission? Yeah, he's uh, leaving Korea today and coming back Saturday, and he's basically spending uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, four days, Mm -hmm. four full days, actually, uh, in the United States. And uh, in that, what I see is uh, just as its main theme, the, the main theme of his visit says, I think the theme itself is kind of in Korean trans- in English translation, I guess, uh, uh, strengthening the cutting edge industry technology alliance. Mm. And I think that that theme is sustained pretty well by what we see in those four days, four full days of his staying here, there. Uh, the the main part of his visit, politically speaking, those events with political dimensions, I think it's a, uh, Wednesday and Thursday in in, in the middle of his uh, you know itinerary. Uh, Wednesday is uh, White House reception, uh, the basic uh, what do you call it, the summit and the dinner and everything for state visit, and then Thursday is important because of his uh, speech to the joint session of the U.S. Congress and uh, meeting with uh, military uh, leaders there. But uh, having those parts in the center, the the first main day of Tuesday and, and uh, Friday, they, they are indeed uh, filled with interesting events that we haven't seen as often before for a state visit. Uh, you know, going back to the theme of strengthening the cutting edge technology and mm-hmm. industry alliance. Um, and we're seeing those on Tuesday and then Friday, having mm. the um, political events uh, sit in the center. Tuesday, his first day of uh, visit there, he's uh, participating in uh, Korea-U.S. Uh, you know, advanced industry uh, kind of future-oriented uh, industry forum, mm-hmm. and uh, there we he will be talking about this bio, bio battery, uh, you know, all these different putting his technology, I'm sure, there. And then he's also sitting with, I think, almost first time or very rare case of his meeting with the movie industry leaders, uh. the movie and the screen uh, contents industry leaders. Mm-hmm. He's me- meeting them on Tuesday, and that's, that's something to note. Mm. And uh, another one on Tuesday is he's visiting uh, the NASA's Goddard Center in uh in Maryland, and that kind of indicates Korea's interest in space technology and related, uh, you know, advanced industries in, mm-hmm. in that area as well. So Tuesday visit is quite interesting. You know, movie and high tech, space, space and all that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And the last day, Friday, is uh, his visit to Boston, and mm-hmm. there in Boston, he's meeting with uh, MIT's uh, leading minds in mm-hmm. bio as well as, uh, you know, the digital industries. There will be interesting uh, meeting, I guess, there at MIT. And then uh, he will also attend a uh, Korea-U.S. kind of cluster roundtable. This this is a roundtable that will talk about, you know, bio clusters and, huh. and you know, right, digital industry clusters and uh, different kinds of, um, and this means something for Korea because we have just announced that semiconductor cluster mm. in, in in Gyeonggi area as well. So, uh, you know, how business cooperate with one another when they form clusters sitting right next to each other and so on. Then it would be very, very interesting. Boston is the right place to do it. The mm. uh, United States has their Silicon Valley, but Boston is has been a very hot place for bio and, and mm-hmm. technology as well on the eastern side of it. So quite a meaningful way. Mm. of um, advancing these issues. And he'll be also um, being, he'll be at the, um, Harvard University giving speech mm. and so on. So his last day visit on Friday would be a very interesting one as well. Together supporting the theme of 
uh, strengthening the technology and advance the industry alliance. Mm. But this, is, this doesn't mean the president can evade. Uh, I'm sure the journalists hard pressing uh, questions around security, namely. So I want to ask you a question about that. Uh, for example, what do you expect the U.S. will offer on the issue of the defense against North Korea's escalating threats and the recent controversy over the Pentagon Intelligence League? I mean, I'm sure there'll be questions around these topics. Yeah, uh, in Korea uh, and uh, in the region, as well as uh, around the world, there is a, uh, a rising voice saying United States is not really doing much about rising uh, tension with North Korea here as North mm. Korea is escalating its nuclear capability. And some experts are saying now North Korea is getting to the point where they're developing capability to attack first and then observe the uh, resp- uh, you know, retaliatory strike from the United States and then respond again at the third round. They are getting to that uh, third step point, developing their capability to deal with that. And they say this is a major advancement and and we don't see uh, much other than United States just words mm-hmm. saying, oh, we have extended deterrence, deterrence. Mm-hmm. And so uh, there's a frustration uh, worldwide. What is it that the United States is doing in dealing with North Korea? There's a Ukraine situation and the Taiwan situation and North and United States, is, uh, attention is getting diverted to those areas. And, mm-hmm. and in the meantime, Kim Jong-un is continuously upgrading its uh, nuclear uh, capability. Mm-hmm. And in Korea, too, there is a rising opinion that the ultimate solution is just South Korea having its own nuclear weapons, no matter how hard it would be procedurally, technologically, that uh, solves everything. We have to go for it. And then, you know, who knows how United States politics will change? Mm-hmm. Who knows whether Trump will come back or someone else will come back, say different things. So we got to have our nuclear weapons. There is a such view rising here. So in response to those you know, um, opinions around the world. The United States will really have to come up with some solid words mm. about how they're going to uh, upgrade the extended deterrence. And, and uh, judging from what we are hearing so far, um, I don't see anything beyond words. And um, right. I'm really looking forward to see something solid and tangible in terms of, you know, next step upgrading this security uh, extended deterrence. So I'll, I'll be closely watching and probably I'll get back to this program to mention it. Mm-hmm. Uh, when the res- results come out. Dr. Kim, I mean, we've talked about it on the program several times, the Pentagon Intelligence League. I mean, it's not just about the fact that this 21-year-old had security clearance to mm-hmm. a, a, a highly damaging, I, I suppose, right. set of documents, um, but it, it's about right. largely uh, the the confidence that these allies would have in the United States. Right, exactly, exactly. Uh, we, we talked about it last week, right. how uh, this, you know, the the... Intelligence gathering takes place among uh, allies, between mm-hmm. allies, very, very actively. Korea does it to that in the United States, and the United States doing it to Korea and all that. So that's one issue. But as you mentioned, how to deal with it, how, how, how you know, like doing so is a separate issue from having this information leaked, as mm-hmm. you mentioned. Mm-hmm. You know, how do we uh, closely guard this kind of uh, security of the information that's that's being processed and so on. It's, it's a it's a huge issue. Mm-hmm. And with this leak, uh, there is a great concern on Korea's side and on Ally's side. What is it that the United States is going to do uh, about that? Uh, one kind of like, a, you know, response to that is that uh, the United States and Korea are going to announce some kind of a tighter security, uh, the cybersecurity uh, uh, cooperation. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, that much we know. It's it's a it's a framework within which you will have to look for some specifics. But um, that's another area. I think <laughs> we are waiting for certain uh, solid, solid, tangible uh, wording that will come out in terms of how you're going to do this. You know, uh, how mm-hmm. you're going to prevent the repetition of Snowden, and then uh, this one on the, uh, once again, how are we going to do that? Uh, that that's a lot of work actually it's a tall order and it happens in you know the time not too long ago before the summit so how much detail solid tangible details both governments can come up with again uh, great mm-hmm. interest will be paid uh, to 
that question on what they will offer. We'll have to close, uh, closely watch. And Dr. Kim, because uh, there is so much on the agenda, I also want to turn our attention to the business and economic front. What can we say are some of the key issues that need to be addressed at the Korea-U.S. Summit? Of course, some reports are already suggesting in regards to the IRA and the CHIPS Act subsidiary programs, uh, namely negotiations have been already made. So it seems that some reports suggest it's unlikely that the U.S. would make further conciliatory gestures. What is your take on it? And what are some of the key issues on the agenda? Right, exactly. Uh, on the economic business side, electric vehicles subsidy mm-hmm. and then uh, chips subsidy. <clears throat> United States has strongly urged just a year ago when Yoon government uh, first uh, entered the office, uh, Biden came like within the less than two weeks of time and and uh, Hyundai Motors and then Samsung Electronics, they, they all announced their commitment of you know, pouring huge amount of money into the United States, building factories, creating jobs for American jobs and so on, and going along with the United States new direction of, um, you know, the reshuffling of the global supply chain mm-hmm. and all that. But now, uh, you know, over the year period of time, uh, because of U.S. domestic politics, uh, the announcement of um, electric vehicle subsidies that excludes Korean cars, and uh, now, uh, what came out recently is that announcement that only about 16 different kinds of vehicles that are produced by uh, U.S.-owned companies will uh, enjoy uh, subsidies for mm. electric vehicles. And uh, that kind of like uh, U.S. commentators emphasize that, well, that excludes everybody, Korea, EU, and Japan. Mm. So, uh, you know, this is fair for everybody other than American car makers. And that's not a strong enough argument. Mm-hmm. We don't exactly buy it. Mm-hmm. And the United States has been for decades leading the leadership of promoting non-discriminatory free trade and so on. But there, this is our right, in my own view, our right violation of WTO rules, mm-hmm. uh, you know, discriminating cars mm-hmm. that are non-U.S. And so <clears throat> what can they offer? Uh, you know, this is a U.S.-Korea bilateral summit. So I think their hands will be tied. Mm. And uh, uh, and there has been ups and downs in terms of prospect of this issue. But now we are on the downside. Things don't look good here. And uh, U.S. Commerce Department and government officials, they'll have to add some words of comfort to uh, Korean interest here. And we have heads of uh, Hyundai Motor, Jung Lee Sun, uh, included in the entourage. And mm. um, it will not look good if there is, no substantive words of comforting coming out of this to yeah. this this uh, largest ever delegation that includes uh, the head of Korea's uh, automaker. So we'll have to wait and see on that one. And then also semiconductor side, uh, right. you, know, uh, you know, all these different requirements. If you want to get your subsidies, uh, you have to follow all these requirements. And Taiwan is big time upset about this. TSMC is extremely upset about it. And Samsung and SK Hynix have their reason to be upset about it. And uh, so this is another one where United States have to offer some kind of words of comfort. <laughs> they have all these fronts where they have to well, offer words of comfort and a lot of work on the side of the United States. And uh, again, kind of similar stories here. Mm. And Dr. Kim, I'm only realizing now how, how massive these topics are, but we're crunched on time. So uh, right. I'm going to turn to some other diplomatic issues uh, related yeah. to Korea's alliance with the U.S. President Yoon faces a rather tough set of challenges in regards to China and Russia. Since his recent interview with Reuters, the president has faced diplomatic backlash from both countries. Uh, how should we understand the whole situation? Yeah, uh, I think... In my own view, President Yoon expressed his view that that needs to be made clear. But uh, because of the reactions from China and Russia, we are, we are experiencing this big turbulence, mm. in, if you will, in domestic politics, criticism being raised and so on. And uh, uh, But in, in a normal <clears throat> situation, I think he did what he had to do, uh, clarify Korea's position uh, before his big visit to the United States. And so he did what Korean presidents or any national president would have done uh, in the past. But I think that the situation overall has changed in a way. And and the way China is reacting, it's beyond anyone's belief, the, the wording, the expression and yeah. everything. And 
and I've been hearing, uh, it's not necessarily my view, I have to hedge like this, but, but I'm, I'm hearing some experts saying that not China, Beijing is moving very close to Pyongyang in terms of their rhetorics, use of rhetorics. Mm. They're using these, these wordings and Strong expressions wording. that, right, that, right. Yeah, that are not acceptable for diplomatic uh, you know, the, the relations and so on. So uh, this side, that makes us realize things have changed. And so I mentioned uh, President Yoon did what uh, heads of states would do in the past. But I, in my own view, I think we might have to uh, adjust a little bit in terms of uh, this uh, traditional practice. Mm. And maybe what I'm saying is that Korea, South Korea has to do what it has to do, make a clearly, uh, you know, stated action, okay. uh, but not necessarily words. Uh, you know, we don't have to issue words, strong words, before our actions. I, what I'm saying is maybe it's time for, uh, it's time to make our actions speak for themselves mm. rather than, issuing words before mm. we take actions. Mm. Uh, that may be a new change that we, we might have to uh, adopt to or uh, we, might, we might have to choose going forward in this new day and age of geopolitics. And that brings us to the last question of the day. I think you've already segued into it, but regarding these China and Russia issues on the table and perhaps the changing dynamics and the changing <laughs> reactions, certainly out of China and Russia, there's a lot of ongoing debates, especially in, in Korean media. It's at times a little bit overwhelming. What are your thoughts on this as an expert? This is an issue that I've been thinking about a lot recently. And uh, first, first of all, my reaction, uh, opposition parties' reaction to the government's mm -hmm. diplomacy, foreign policy. Uh, you know, for decades, the way I studied this subject area of international relations, the common wisdom is that you don't use foreign policy diplomacy issues for domestic political use because if you do so it makes you as a country weaker mm -hmm. to other countries you don't debate and argue about foreign policy and diplomacy and when you take actions and when you make a statement you act as one as a nation that's what i've been taught and what i have believed over the decades mm -hmm. and so what i've seen uh, you know in korean politics recently have taken me aback and then i've been uh, and I've been troubled, and I've been looking around uh, what, what the facts are. And in, indeed, as a result of it, I realized this is actually happening all around the world. Many countries around the world, they debate foreign policy uh, for the consumption of their domestic politics. And it's, it's, it's a new thing, and it's a reality. And I guess it's a new, a new reality for the day and age of social media, polarizing mm -hmm. politics, and so on. But that doesn't mean that we cannot be different here. And uh, still, I think the opinion leader should come out and speak for the need for Korea to act as a one when we do, uh, you know, foreign policy and diplomacy. And in that regard, one point that I mentioned early on a few weeks ago about the so-called leadership uh, opinion leaders in Korea, in religion, in academia, the non-experts, people who do not spend their lifetime uh, in talking about these issues, coming out, raising issues, targeting, setting their political uh, positions on foreign policy and diplomacy, I think it's a great disservice because people might just think, oh, well, these are you know great leaders in their fields, and when they speak out uh, against the government on foreign policy and so on, people may be led to believe maybe there is something wrong about it. But, but what I'm saying is, uh, you know, thought leaders, opinion leaders will have to become much more responsible in yeah. expressing their positions on the issues that where they are not experts of. If I'm, um, you know, expressing my opinion about health policy and, <laughs> and policy on medication, um, medicine and education, that's not exactly right if I do that on this program, right? Uh, so just <laughs> the same thing applies the, the other way around, the way I see it. <laughs> And in the meantime, I, I guess I cannot highlight the fact that enough media literacy is just that much more important. And uh, take these uh, so-called opinions with a grain of salt. And I, I, I do believe yeah. that cross-checking is not dated at all. In fact, exactly. fact-checking is more important than ever before. All Dr. Right. Kim, thank you so much for your insights. We appreciate the candor and we'll speak to you again next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.